President of the United States is obviously an incredibly important position, but it is also one that's a bit slippery to understand. Your textbook chapter does a fine job of detailing the constitutional provisions relating to the presidency and the various roles and responsibilities of modern day presidents. These are very important to know, but they're also relatively straightforward. The bigger challenge in understanding the presidency is to examine how the powers of the office are executed dynamically by the different individuals who occupy the office. The formal powers of the office have changed very little over the course of time, but the ways in which different presidents use the office to try to advance their agendas has changed enormously over time and from president to president. This lecture will examine some of the subtleties of presidential power. The President of the United States is the most recognizable figure in the American political system. Many view voters choose only to vote during presidential election years, as that is the only electoral race they focus on. Most Americans have difficulty identifying their senators or their representative in the House, but nearly every American can name the President and has enough information to at least form a general impression of that person. This is not how the framers thought things would work out. They believed members of Congress, especially those from the House, would be much more well known in their communities than the president. But as the country changed, as congressional districts got larger, those personal ties between citizens and legislators got weaker. At the same time, modern communications technology allowed presidents to develop much more direct ties with the citizenry. Things have evolved to the point where Americans tend to look first and sometimes look only to the president as a powerful leader who can tackle national problems. In his speech at the 2016 Republican National Convention, accepting his party's nomination, Donald Trump described America as beset by poverty and violence at home, as well as war and destruction abroad, and then claimed, I alone can fix it. This claim of nearly omnipotent power is the sort of thing the framers worried about when they set about designing a presidency that would not lead to tyranny. Even though the role of the president has grown far beyond what the framers envisioned, Americans do still express suspicion of presidents who act aggressively and on their own, especially with the presidency of George W. Bush, but continuing through the Obama and Trump presidencies, many people have critiqued what they see as the emergence of an imperial presidency in which the presidents have greatly overstepped their bounds. Presidential campaigns are filled with promises of problems the candidate will solve once they get into office, but most candidates spend very little time explaining how they will fulfill promises that require the cooperation of others in order to carry them out. It's sometimes called the presidential power trap, where candidates promise the moon because the public expects so much out of the president. But once in office, presidents find it extremely difficult to fulfill pledges especially in the face of resistance from other branches of government. Presidents weren't always such predominant players in the U.S. political system. Until the 1900s, most presidents were beholden to party leaders and activists. Loyalty to the party was crucial for gaining the nomination. Presidents were expected to be an important part of executing a party's agenda, but they were not considered to be the primary drivers of that agenda. Instead, Congress took the lead role in determining the legislative agenda. Oftentimes, presidents were not even renominated by their parties for a second term. A piece of trivia that exemplifies the relative weakness of presidents in an early, earlier era of American history is the fact that from 1836 through 1932, basically a century, only two presidents, Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses Grant, won consecutive presidential elections. The history has shifted the tide in favor of presidents relative to Congress. As the economy has grown more complex and interwoven, Congress's ability to regulate the economy through legislation has become more difficult, as the details of policy have become more intricate and specialized. Many of our rules and regulations revolve around questions of scientific expertise that is beyond the technical capacity of most members of Congress. So Congress has adapted by writing laws that leave many of the technical details to be filled in by technical experts working in various federal government agencies. Since these agencies are part of the executive branch, 
that provides the president more power to shape the ways in which laws are carried out in practice. And as people's sources of news have shifted from local to national, the president has gained a higher profile than locally based officials, giving presidents more of a platform, independent of the party, to appeal to the American people. And as the U.S. has become a world superpower, the president's substantial powers in the international realm have gained greater importance. So now we have a president-centered system where the president can take sweeping unilateral action unavailable to any other single official in government. And yet, at the same time, separation of powers, world events, and economic twists and turns beyond the control of any single actor still act as tremendous limiting forces on any president. The paradox of presidential power is that even within a single administration, a president can appear alternately as nearly unstoppable to appearing virtually powerless to control, it, control the events around him. So what is the toolbox of powers that presidents can exercise to try, but not always succeed, at shaping events to their will? One source are the formal powers derived from the Constitution, which states that the executive power shall be invested in a president of the United States of America. Your chapter spells out what these powers are, and you should know them. But I want to focus here on the informal powers of the president. These are the powers that go beyond legal specifics, but have more to do with the unique position of the presidency in American life. The scholar most widely recognized for clearly detailing the informal powers of the presidency is Richard Neustadt. He published a groundbreaking book in 1960 that led to a more nuanced understanding of presidential power than what came before. Neustadt's work emphasized that American government is as much about shared powers as it is about separation of powers. Because of the checks and balances put into place by the framers, any president who wants to get things done has to gain the cooperation of other people in the system who have their own constitutionally based powers. Government action in general, and presidential action in particular, is limited. Congress and the president share the tasks of both legislating and executing the laws. The Bill of Rights and the judiciary place limits on what government can do. Private actors, such as major corporations, religious institutions, and social movements, as well as the press, are autonomous. They act independently of the will of the president. And actors on the international stage are also autonomous. They do not take orders from the president. But we expect the president to get things done, which means we expect the president to find ways to work with Congress, the courts, private actors, and actors on the international stage in order to solve problems. The informal powers of a president can aid a president in working with others to get things done. One of these informal powers is what Teddy Roosevelt referred to as the bully pulpit. As the only elected leader in American government who represents the entire country, the president is uniquely situated to argue that he represents the voice of the people. The office of the president provides a pulpit, if you will, from which the president can attempt to bully or cajole people to go along with him. This informal power has only grown since Roosevelt's time, as media technology has advanced the ability of the president to present his case directly to the people. The bully pulpit is especially effective for setting the agenda, determining the issues that get the most debate and discussion in American politics, and also for molding public opinion. A second critically informal power of the president is that of party leader. Shared party identification is perhaps the most important factor for overcoming obstacles to cooperation between the president and Congress created by the separation of powers. Members of Congress who share the president's party label have a built-in incentive to cooperate with the president and help him succeed, since members of the same party tend to sink or swim together at the next election. Presidents can also use their position atop a political party to provide favors for supportive party members and sometimes punishment for party members who fail to go along with the president. As an example, in 2017, as the Senate was debating bills to repeal the Affordable Care Act, 
One Republican senator from Nevada, Dean Heller, initially opposed President Trump's supported bill in the Senate. However, once President Trump suggested he might endorse another Republican to challenge Senator Heller in the 2018 primary election in Nevada, Senator Heller quickly fell in line and became a reliable vote for the president's position. So how does a president get other autonomous actors to go along with what the president wants? Richard Neustadt's insight was that the essence of presidential power is the power to bargain. The most quoted passage from Neustadt's book captures this, where he states, when one man shares authority with another, but does not gain or lose his job upon the other's whim, his willingness to act upon the urging of the other turns on whether he conceives the action to be right for him. The essence of a president's persuasive task is to convince such men that what the White House wants of them is what they ought to do for their own sake and on their own authority. In Neustadt's view, the formal constitutional and the informal powers of the presidency essentially give the president a certain number of chips in an ongoing bargaining game. Presidents can use those chips effectively or not, some better than others. In Neustadt's view, the key to presidential persuasion lies in bargaining. This is different from argument or rhetoric, which involve use, using communication strategies to win a debate or convince others that the president's ideas are best. Instead, bargaining acknowledges that disagreements with the president are the natural result of competing interests and incentives. Members of Congress have distinct constituencies from the president. Sometimes they hesitate to go along with the president because they worry about the impact of the president's plans in their own state or district. Foreign leaders respond to their own national constituencies. They do not automatically see things the way the president does. It's up to the president to bargain using the powers of the office to find ways to get others to find it in their own best interest to agree to cooperate with the president. Neustadt found that professional reputation and public prestige were key resources for effective presidential bargaining. Presidents who have reputations as effective administrators and reliable negotiators tend to be more successful because they can persuade others that the bargains they strike with the president will actually be carried out. Public prestige is important because members of Congress, the courts, and even the private sector tend to want to avoid standing in the way of a president who has an approving public behind him. Bargaining power comes down to an individual president's political skills at overcoming obstacles set up by the separation of powers and the fact that people in government have a variety of self-interests. This political skill is demonstrated through what is sometimes called an inside game. In other words, a process that largely takes place in the corridors of power beyond the view of the general public. Presidents who play this inside game effectively can inspire both love and fear. Love in the sense that others see benefits from going along with the president. Maybe their chances for re-election improve, or some critical project in their district gets funded, or they get a better committee assignment. Good presidents know which buttons to press to get which people to go along with them. On the other hand, effective presidents can also inspire some fear of what might happen if they stand in the way of a presidential initiative. Maybe a member of Congress will lose the president's support for a key piece of legislation they've sponsored, or perhaps contributions to their re-election campaign fund will suddenly dry up. One example of successful presidential bargaining include, includes President Obama's efforts to gain passage of the Affordable Care Act. This massive piece of legislation is the largest reform to the American health insurance system in half a century. Healthcare reform had eluded Presidents Carter and Clinton despite major efforts on their part to enact reforms. Healthcare is an incredibly complicated part of American society with lots of different stakeholders who sometimes have competing interests, patients, employers, hospitals, healthcare professionals, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, etc., etc. On top of that, you have partisan divisions with Democrats and Republicans tending to have very different views about how the system should be changed. The Affordable Care Act took over a year to pass from the time of its introduction because it involved intense bargaining between President Obama, members of Congress, and key stakeholders in the healthcare arena. 
For a president, generally credited more for his rhetorical abilities than his skill at playing the inside game, this was a major accomplishment in the area of presidential bargaining. Another example comes from President Lyndon Johnson. The, the photo on this slide shows LBJ giving what was called the treatment to a member of Congress. LBJ was an aggressive, in-your-face negotiator. He developed close relationships with many members of Congress and knew their personal priorities. His knowledge of what others wanted, combined with his relentlessness as a negotiator, made LBJ especially effective at the inside game. These skills were particularly on display as he successfully guided the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to successful passage, the most significant piece of civil rights legislation since the end of Reconstruction. While Richard Neustadt emphasized the inside game as the key to presidential power, more and more in recent years, presidents have been adopting a different strategy to gain approval for their initiatives, and that's called going public. Going public consists of an outside game in which presidents try to mobilize public opinion in their favor as a way of convincing others in government to go along. Essentially, it involves going over the head of Congress by having the president appeal directly to the public and encouraging the public to pressure their members of Congress to go along with the president's initiative. This is a risky strategy because it can easily backfire and result in an embarrassing loss for the president. When it does work, though, it can break through log jams in D.C. by pressuring hesitant lawmakers and get action moving on initiatives that were previously stalled. However, the downside is that it antagonizes lawmakers and can box the president into a publicly stated position. Both of these things make bargaining more difficult without one side or the other losing face. One remarkably successful example of the going public approach was President Kennedy's initiative to massively size up the United States' space program with the goal of landing a man on the moon. This initiative captured the public imagination and helped JFK win the resources necessary for NASA to begin upscaling its program. Another example of the going public strategy came in 2002 and 2003 as President George W. Bush engaged in an aggressive public campaign to gain con congressional approval for an invasion of Iraq. Many Democrats who were up for re-election in the fall of 2002 feared the public backlash of opposing the primary foreign policy initiative of a president who enjoyed 70% public approval ratings one year after 9-11. President Bush got the votes he needed from enough Democrats to demonstrate bipartisan support for going to war. On the unsuccessful side, in 2011, President Obama faced an economy that was still recovering from the Great Recession of 2008. He proposed a jobs plan to provide incentives for businesses and state and local governments to hire new employees. Despite a concerted effort that involved giving speeches throughout the country, President Obama failed to win over any Republicans to support his plan. Similarly, while President Trump treat while President Trump tweets <laughs> frequently about building a wall along the U.S.-Mexico border and chants of build the wall break out at every rally that he holds, so far Congress has done little to nothing to make the wall a reality. While this initiative is very popular with the president's enthusiastic supporters, there's not much evidence that this public strategy has persuaded many lawmakers in Congress to make this initiative a priority. The strategies of bargaining and going public are based on the idea that the president needs the buy-in of others in the system to get things done. This is certainly true for passing new laws or ratifying treaties. But one thing that has happened in the past couple decades is that presidential persuasion has become a more difficult task as the parties in Congress and in the general public have become more polarized. Presidents Clinton, Bush, Obama, and Trump have increasingly found that there are few people on the other side of the aisle who can be persuaded that it's in their best interest to go along with the president of the other party. This has particularly manifested itself in legislative gridlock, where Congress passes many fewer laws than it did throughout most of the 20th century. When presidents find their legislative agendas stall, they have become increasingly likely to adopt a strategy of unilateral action 
to focus on areas of their agenda they, they can accomplish on their own with little or no need to persuade others in government. One power of the president to act unilaterally is through the use of executive orders. Executive orders are presidential commands to some aspect of the executive branch to restructure the way they do things. Since the president has the power to execute the laws, he has pretty wide latitude to determine exactly how those laws get carried out by the federal agencies under his purview. Not unlimited power, mind you, but significant power. So, for example, in the late 1940s, President Truman desegregated the military with the stroke of a pen through an executive order. FDR created the Works Progress Administration, which created 8 million public works jobs through an executive order, but also infamously issued the order that led to the imprisonment of Japanese Americans in internment camps during World War II. More recently, President Obama used executive orders to create the DACA program, providing protection for deportation and work permits to undocumented immigrants who are brought to the United States as children. He also instructed the Environmental Protection Agency to draw up new rules for power plants to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Further, many laws are structured by Congress to give the president broad prerogatives to take future action without congressional input. For example, President Trump recently imposed substantial tariffs on foreign steel imports. He was able to do this because Congress gave the president the power to unilaterally impose certain tariffs if the president deemed them necessary to ensure national security. And in the area of foreign affairs, the president has much broader unilateral powers than he does over domestic policy. The president can establish diplomatic relations. President Obama used this power to normalize U.S. relations with Cuba for the first time in over half a century. President Trump used this power to move the United States Embassy in Israel to, Jeru to Jerusalem. Presidents can sign executive agreements with foreign governments that act like treaties, but don't require the approval of the Senate. For instance, President Obama used this power to commit the United States to the Paris Climate Accord to combat global climate change. And presidents use their power as commander in chief to determine when and where U.S. armed forces will be deployed. The primary drawback of unilateral action is that it is much easier for future presidents to undo these actions than it is to repeal laws passed by Congress. We can see this in the current administration, as President Trump has thus far been unsuccessful in getting Congress to repeal the Affordable Care Act but he has succeeded in undoing a number of President Obama's unilateral actions, including the Paris Climate Accord and the Iran nuclear deal, his efforts to overturn DACA and the Environmental Protection Agency's Clean Power Plan are less certain. They're currently being adjudicated by the judicial branch, but they are likely to be overturned eventually. This is a significant problem for American government. The framers created a system that encouraged gradual change through consensus building. But as consensus becomes harder and harder to find these days, Congress becomes log jammed, and so presidents strike out on their own with major unilateral initiatives, only to have those initiatives overturned when a president from the other party gains power. This kind of yo-yoing of public policy has a derogatory effect on both how Americans view their own government and how actors abroad view us as a stable or unstable partner on the international stage. This lecture has discussed some of the informal powers and strategies presidents deploy to try to get things done. I have emphasized the presidents are incredibly powerful in the American political system, but also deeply constrained when the things they want to do require the cooperation of others, inside or outside of American government. Ultimately, it's up to each individual president to combine their personal skills and abilities with the powers of the office to achieve as much as they can for the American people. When talking about the presidency, presidential character is an incredibly important subject, but also incredibly difficult to discuss in a systematic way. We've only had 44 men occupy the office of the presidency in its 230 years of existence and evaluations of character are deeply subjective, so it's hard to provide objective measures. Nevertheless, it's useful to try to explore, at least generally, 
what makes a president successful or unsuccessful. To that end, I would like you to examine two sites. I will put the links in the course announcement for this week's module. The first is an article written by the journalist John Dickerson in 2012 about what we would look for in a presidential candidate if we took seriously the idea of a presidential campaign as being a sort of job interview. The second is a survey of 91 presidential historians conducted in 2017 in which they were asked to rank the presidents along 10 different qualities of presidential leadership. After reading those sources, I would like you to reflect on what you consider to be the most important qualities in a president and how you can spot those qualities in somebody you only know through the media.